Well, welcome. It is great to see you. And as you can tell by the title of the series, we're going to talk about the invisible war, what every believer needs to know about Satan, demons, and spiritual combat. When you talk about spiritual warfare and you think of the Christian community, you have the spectrum, don't you? I mean, that, that raises issues like they're going to teach that here you know, and and over here you have people that I mean, it is what they talk about all the time and, you know, demonic spirits and territorial spirits and there's all kind of things with the unseen world. And then you have whole branches of Christendom that would intellectually acknowledge that, yes, the Bible talks about Satan and demons, but, you know, that was probably at another time in another world and I don't really see that stuff playing out. Uh, in our day in this way. And and sometimes, I don't know about you, but if you flick the little clicker on TV and you hear someone talking about spiritual battle and you and I have heard literally some of the most wacko stuff I've ever heard in my life, have you ever just thought to yourself, I wonder what the Bible actually teaches? So open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter six, 10 to 20, and open your notes if you will, and let's start with Spiritual Warfare 101. This is the central teaching of the entire New Testament on spiritual warfare. So let's cover tonight verses 10 to 12, and then I want to develop five basic truths. I mean the most elementary basic truths about spiritual warfare out of Ephesians 6, 10 to 12. The apostle Paul says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God. Why? That you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. This reason, for the struggle, our struggle, is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Now, in the margin, you might write two commands. In verses 10, 11, and 12, there are two commands. The first command is in verse 10. And this command is, be strong in the Lord. And then it tells you how, and in the strength of his might. Whatever we know about this battle, it's not about you mustering up certain strength or doing something on your own. There is strength available, there's power available, and the only way to win this war is be strong in the Lord, in what you already possess that he's told you about in Ephesians chapter one, two, and three. Now, for those of you that kind of like a little bit of the grammar, this is in the present imperative, that means it's a command, And it's in what's called grammatically the passive voice. And that doesn't mean a lot to you. So notice in the notes it says verse 10, general command. The passive voice means you can't do it, but you have to allow God to do something, yet it's a command to obey. So are you ready? This is the Chip Ingram paraphrase. Allow yourself to be continually strengthened by the power already available to you in your new position and relationship with Christ. And then alluding to what power? The power that raised Christ from the dead and now dwells in you. So there's a command. You need to allow God to work in your life in such a way that the power that has been made available in your new relationship with him gives you the strength to win this battle. You're going to find that you've already won the war. Now notice the second command is how to do it. Well, how do you do that? It says put on the full armor of God with the purpose is the idea that you can stand firm or literally it's hold your ground. You're already in a conflict, but you're to put on the armor of God. That's God's provision so you can actively win this battle because you've already run the war. And so he says how to do this. You put on the full armor of God. That's verse 11. It's by continually and repeatedly putting on at specific points in time the spiritual protection God has provided for you. This verb is a little bit different one. It's in a tense that means at a punctiliar, at a point in time. The other one was a command, but this one says it it has the idea of a sense of urgency. At specific times, you need to be ready and urgent and ready. Put on the armor of God. And this is what's called the middle voice. It's something that you cooperate and you do for yourself. You do it for the express purpose of holding on to your position in Christ as you're bombarded by satanic strategies designed to destroy you and or render you ineffective in your kingdom pursuits. So he's saying, be strong in the Lord. That's the way you win. 
How do you do it? By putting on the full armor of God. Where is the battle? There are, did you notice the little word in your notes, schemes? Circle that word. We get our English word strategies. There's an invisible angelic being who has a host of demons that has specific strategies to take you out, to tempt you, to deceive you, to get you to believe lies, to get you to be drawn away from God, to get your heart filled with partial truths and untruths, to get you to try and go after a good thing in the wrong way or the wrong time or with the wrong person. He's got schemes. Now, notice, why do we need to do this? The reason is verse 12. He says, for our struggle. And you might circle that word. Uh, This word struggle means hand-to-hand combat. It was used in ancient Greek times of two people going into a wrestling match or hand-to-hand combat until one person was in victory and could hold the other person down. For our struggle, our battle, our hand-to-hand combat is not, notice, It's not with circumstances, it's not with people, it's not with another person, it's not with an organization. You get the idea? It is not with flesh and blood. The struggle struggle or the conflict isn't a material issue, but it's an invisible war. And then what he begins to list for you is a very clear hierarchy of demonic power. Just like there are generals and lieutenants and majors and sergeants, he says it's not flesh and blood that your battle's against, but against the powers, against world forces of this darkness, against spiritual forces of wickedness. He makes it very clear it's because this real struggle or wrestling match isn't against physical, material adversaries, but against a hierarchy of demonic forces doing battle in the spiritual realm. Now, Paul basically is, you know what, when his readers were reading this, Unlike being in the 21st century, they weren't going, ooh, wow, that sounds kind of weird. Demonic activity was very common in that day. They understood all about it. And he was just telling them some things that were realities in their life. Because like us, what happens? We get thinking the problem is our mate. We get thinking the problem is our boss. We get thinking the problem is one of our kids. We get thinking it's, it's circumstances and situations. And we don't understand behind those things. There's an arch enemy that wants to use those to destroy our life. Now, we all make choices, and sometimes the consequences are uh, bad things happen to us. We don't blame that on demonic forces or the enemy. Uh, uh, Sometimes, uh, you know, it's just a fallen world and circumstances happen. Everything, again, is not because of demonic forces. The danger as we approach this is to think that everything has to do with Satan and demons or that nothing has to do with Satan and demons. As C.S. Lewis, I think, aptly said, when speaking about the reality of Satan and demonic activity, the danger is always twofold, to put way too much emphasis or way too little. And so with that, here's what I'd like to do. This is 101. I want to give you five basic truths that just flow right out of this passage and, and that you can know for sure this is true about spiritual warfare. Five basic truths about spiritual warfare. Truth number one, there is an invisible world that is just as real as the visible world. Now we are, you know, empiricalism and scientific method. You know, we've got now a couple, three, four centuries since the enlightenment that we want to explain everything and test everything and measure everything. What I want you to know, there is a world. There's a world that you can't see. It's invisible. But it's as real as touching your skin. It's as real as when you kiss one of your children on the cheek and put them to bed. It's as real as when someone back ends into you and you find yourself with lower back pain and back spasms. We've got multiple examples. You know, for centuries, people couldn't see bacteria, but was bacteria real? Viruses, are they real? Electricity, I can't see it, but it's doing some things, isn't it? Natural gas, I can't see it, but... You know what? I've got a little thing in my house that if I light this and turn a little switch over here, carbon monoxide, I can't see it. I can't smell it. It is completely invisible. But if you stay in a room with enough of it, what will it do? It'll kill you. There's an invisible world. Let me give you an Old Testament example and a New Testament example. Turn in your Bibles, if you would, to 2 Kings 6. And as you turn there, I'm going to look at verses, uh, pick it up at verse 15. And this is the, the story of one of the great prophets, Elisha. 
And, and as you turn there, I'll give you a little background. Elisha is uh, making this king absolutely crazy. And uh, he's doing a number of amazing things. He's God's man, and tremendous things are happening. And so they are trying to get rid of him. But every time they try to get rid of him, he sneaks out of it, or he knows it's coming. And finally, he gets fed up and says, you know what? I'm going to put an end to this thing. He gets a whole army together. He gets word where he is. He has an army and horsemen and chariots, and he surrounds the city. And he's going to get this prophet once and for all. And uh, the, the prophet has a, a servant who works with him. And, you know, I don't know if he kind of got up and got his clothes ready or cooked a little breakfast or went out and got water. But, you know, the guy kind of gets up early and, you know, they're good buddies. And, uh-oh, loose translation here. Hey, boss, yeah, we got problems. Yeah, what? Come out here. You got to see this. And the guy goes, we're dead, we're dead. What are we going to do? I mean, it's surrounded troops and, and chariots. I mean, it's, there's no way. And this is a very interesting text in the Old Testament where God wants us to understand there are invisible realities that we do not see, but they are very, very real. Into that situation, verse 15, now when the intendant of the man of God had risen early and gone out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was circling the city. And his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? So he answered, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those with them. And I'm thinking, if I'm that servant, I'm thinking, this guy's a prophet. God speaks through him. He's powerful, but he's terrible in math. <laughs> you know, I'm going, hey, yo, hey, hey, bro, come, come on out here. What, let, let's count again. You, me, that's two. Now let's count all those. And then notice what he does. Look at verse 17. Then Elisha prayed and said, O Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. The Old Testament clearly documents that there is an invisible world that is real. He prayed, and he had the power for that moment of time to see angelic beings and the protection that he had. In the New Testament, we have 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 5. We'll look at it more later, but all, the only point I want to make is the Apostle Paul will say, the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh. Though we live according to the flesh, we don't battle according to the flesh. He, he's going to say there's an invisible world, and he's going to introduce the idea that not only that, but there's an invisible war. In fact, not in your notes, but you want to jot down a very interesting passage, Daniel chapter 10, because there is a connection between this invisible world and this visible world. It's an old, old booklet that had a great impact on me by Francis Schaeffer, a little booklet called Two Contents, Two Realities. Francis Schaeffer just makes the point. There are two contents. There is a content of a material world, and there is a content of a spiritual world. There is a visible world and an invisible world. And there is a content of men and flesh and organizations and trees and sky and tangible things, and just as parallel, a real, invisible, non-material world. And there are realities occurring in this invisible world, and there are realities that we experience in this visible world, and then Schaefer made the point, there is an arch or a connection between the invisible and the visible. And if you would read Daniel 10 very carefully, you find that he, is, he gets revelation that he doesn't understand. So he fasts and prays, and he gets no answer for the first 21 days. And after 21 days, I mean, one of the big heavy duty, like uh, supercharged angels comes, not just a regular angel, and he says, Daniel your prayer was heard on high and answered from the first day. But I was dispatched, and I've been doing battle with the king of Persia. Now, we, we don't understand exactly, not a lot of details, and people make a lot of it. Here's what we know for sure. An angel was doing battle somewhere, and the, God was answering his prayer, and something happened in this invisible reality that had an impact on the visible reality. When a man prays, God is answering, and there's not only an invisible world, but fact number two, basic truth number two, we are involved in an invisible war. We're involved in a cosmic conflict 
that has eternal implications. Notice what the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 5. For though we walk in the flesh, we don't war. Notice that word, war. That's a battle term, according to the flesh. Why? For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. And then he begins to tell us where this war occurs. We are destroying speculations and everything raised up against the knowledge of God, and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Put a line under every thought captive. The battleground for this invisible war, this cosmic conflict, is largely between your ears. The attack is on your mind. He is the father of lies. He is a deceiver. He is a deluder. He casts doubt on God. He casts doubt on his word. He casts doubt on you. He wants you to believe a set of lies. And when you do spiritual warfare, he says, we, we pull down destructive, lofty things against the knowledge of God, and we take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Your mind, your belief system, your worldview, that's where the great majority of the battle occurs. And if you, don't, if you think this is just a small-time deal, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. It's speaking here of, uh, in, in whose case, the God of this world, Satan, has blinded the, the minds. Underline that word. The minds of unbelievers. Why? That they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. The battle is for the minds. See, we, we tend to think that the knowledge of God is an intellectual issue. It is not. It is a spiritual and a moral issue. And the God of this world, part of his battle, part of his strategy is to blind the mind of people so they can't ascertain, they can't grasp. By the way, we'll hit on this much later, this is why intercessory prayer is so vital and important. There is a relationship. Now, what that relationship is, I don't know. I can tell you it flows right out of the New Testament text. How it works, I'm not even gonna begin to try and explain it. But here's what I can tell you, is that there is a relationship between a man or woman beseeching God and praying for people and their eyes being able to see. And when people are coming to Christ, I'll guarantee one thing about a church. Somewhere, somehow in that church, someone believes in prayer and isn't talking about it, they're doing it. And you know what? I mean, in Jesus' life. In Jesus' life, when Jesus was tempted, when Jesus was in the agony, am I going to do the Father's will? Let's remember now. Let's get our theology clear. Jesus didn't have like a nice robe and a nice beard and, and have an S on his chest, you know, underneath you know, like when it really got hard, he would forget being a man and go, bum, ba, bum, ba, 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 He was fully man, and he was fully God. He was tempted in every way like us, but did not sin. He was tempted with lust. Jesus was. He was tempted to quit. He was tempted with depression. He was tempted with envy. He was tempted with anger. He was tempted with the false beliefs that what, these people won't appreciate this sacrifice. Don't die for him. This is too much. He agonized as a human being, fully man, fully God. He agonized to the point of sweating great drops of blood. What did Jesus do in order to overcome the temptation? Where did he go and what did he do? He prayed. And, and his three closest friends what is the one thing he asked them to do? He had a need in his life. He was in a spiritual battle. What did he ask him to do? Pray. When Peter, remember? The last night, Peter, Satan has request, requested to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you. No, well, wait a second. He's God, right? Yeah. Well, why didn't he just speak a word and say, Satan, get behind him or something? He's modeling for us Jesus walked with the Father in total dependence in the power of the Holy Spirit and lived a perfect life, modeling for us what it looked like. And when someone was being tempted or harassed by the enemy, Jesus' solution was to pray. Do, do you understand? You are involved in a visible and invisible world that intersect. And there is a war going on a cosmic conflict 
that has eternal implications. The souls of men and the souls of women and the souls of little boys and little girls of every nationality, of every color, of every persuasion, of every background all over the planet. That is what is at stake. And the enemy seeks to blind, and we'll see how. And he seeks to dull. And their souls and their lives and their futures forever and ever and ever are at stake. That's what spiritual warfare is all about. Let me stop for a moment of application. When was the last time you honestly considered some struggle or relational conflict in your life that, that the roots could be satanic opposition? Okay, when, when's the last time? Now, again, am I saying that it's, you know, this, this is not, oh, I had a flat tire, that must be the flat tire demon, or, or I, you know, I burned the steak, that must be the uh, too hot barbecue demon, or, you know, I lost my job because I didn't show up and didn't do a very good job, that must be the, I got a bad boss demon. No, 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 okay? We're talking some good biblical common sense. I'm talking about regular, ordinary people like you who walk with God, who love God, who have normal conflict, who don't see a demon under every bush, but, but when's the last time you had some things you couldn't explain? You know, like someone you've, you've loved and trusted and had a great relationship with, and, and then it just it starts going south. And they love God, you love God, and no matter what you try and do, you can't get it together. Or, or you, you, there's, it's a church, it's a great church, and God has really used the church, and something's wrong. S something's amiss, and no one can put their finger on it. And, and then there's a sense of oppression or depression. Or for my case, my personal life, as I begin to prepare about three weeks for this, I didn't think much of it at first, and the lady pulls out and totals my car, and, you know, it wasn't a big deal, and nobody got hurt, and, you know, then two days later, we, we had some bushes that we'd been trying to take out, so they took out the bushes and broke one little sprinkler. Well, it's not a big deal, except the guy who came to fix the sprinkler cut the telephone line, and... The one little sprinkler turned into, well, this was done, and then, he, the, then the water, first time ever in 26 years, I've been working on houses, then our whole water system wouldn't work, and then I, we, 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 Teresa and Annie and I were out to dinner one night in about a five-day period. As soon as I started to teach this, there was probably about 15 or 16 things. It just got laughable. I remember in Santa Cruz, we would have musicals, and you know, we normally see sometimes hundreds of people come to Christ. I've had as many five or six appliances go out in 24 hours. I mean, that's not exactly like coincidence. <laughs> Five basic truths about spiritual warfare. Number one, there's an invisible world that's just as real as the visible world. Number two, we are involved in an invisible war, a cosmic conflict that has eternal implications. And number three, our foe is formidable and his goal is to destroy us. Destroy us and discredit the cause of Christ. I'm uh, reading a book right now, and uh, a fellow named, it's unpublished, but the fellow who wrote it summarizes Satan's goal. Satan and his forces have a plan, I love the way he puts this, to terrorize your soul, to render you impotent as a believer, to make you worthless to the cause of Christ, and to make your life one of misery and spiritual defeat. I, I cannot improve on that. Wow. Have you, have you, do you realize there is a personal demonic spirits who want to terrorize your soul, that want to render you impotent as a believer, that want to make your life miserable, wow. You say, that's pretty strong. Well, look at the scripture, 1 Peter 5, 8. Peter, in this situation, writes, be sober. The word means be serious. Be sober of spirit. Be on the alert. Literally, the word means wake up, be watchful. Get on top of your game. Your adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. It, it, it doesn't say he's playing tag. He's seeking someone to devour. And that's why he says, be sober. Be alert. Your enemy, your adversary, the one who wants to destroy you and those you love, he's prowling around. What do lions do when they prowl? They're looking. They're looking. They're looking. What are they looking for? Something that's vulnerable and easy to kill. So it's not all the time. It's at the right time in the right way. It's when you're low. It's when you're tired. It's when you're traveling. It's late at night. It's after everyone goes to bed. It's when something pops up on the computer screen and you can think, oh. It's when something comes on the tube and you would never watch that if anyone else is in the room and you say, oh, that is shocking. It's terrible. I can't believe they put it on in prime time. And then I hope no one 
comes in and looks, and you're sucked in. And then you feel dirty, and you feel bad, and you say, I'm a believer, and I'm a leader in the church, and I can't believe I watched 10 minutes of that junk. (sighs) And then the enemy comes and says, what? You call yourself a Christian, right? Right? See, he gets you with the temptation, then the double whammy is guilt, condemnation, right? الكتاب المقدس هو كلمه 